Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us online for church this morning. We are so glad you're here. Go ahead and get comfortable before we dive in. And remember to share this video or even send it to family and friends so you can invite them to join you for church. Good morning, church. Uh, so glad you can join us online. We miss you. Um, we're going to worship now. So worship with us from your homes. Let's just invite Jesus to be with us this morning. Place and fill the atmosphere. 
name is Haley Bailey. I just wanted to give you guys some announcements for this week. We have our weekly prayer conference with Vicki Adema at 10 a.m. on Mondays. If you would like to join that, just text Prayer Warrior to 626 253 1919. We'd love to see you there or hear you there. Gabe Aguirre is also doing a Bible study group still on Wednesdays at 6 30. So contact him or the office for more details there. Dar and Ray Zern have been so generous to open up their home to the youth. And we are planning a pool party July 11th from 1 to 4 p.m. So youth, get ready to have some fun. <laughs> you can give online on our website app or you can mail in a check to 100 East Foothill Boulevard, San Dimas, California, 91773. Again, we are so, so glad you're here. Thanks for joining us today, you guys. Welcome, everyone. So glad that you're with, a, uh, with us again online. Um, today, we're doing part three of a series called Reset Church, and I'm really excited to dive into what we're going to talk about today. But before I do that, as we are reemerging from the, this cocoon that we've been in for so long, last three months, um, I want you to know I've been praying for each of you, and uh, our heart is for us trying to regather. And I know that you're watching us online today. That's great. Um, and we want you to watch online until you feel safe and, and ready to uh, come out. But um, w this Sunday, we've started to gather in our auditorium again and worship together. And it's been, we're really excited about meeting this morning. So when you're ready, come on out, visit us 9 or 11. Uh, we're excited about that. And just so you know, there's tons of brand new things to do around the church. We have, the deacon team has done so much over the last three months. Um, there's lots of little things. If you want to do something on the side, call the church office. We'll get you plugged into something. And then also like on Sunday mornings now, because we went from one service to two, there's so many things that we just have to rethink and reboot and redo. So if you're interested, um, call the church office and we'll, we'll plug you in. Um, so today, I said part three, today we're looking at, as we're resetting the church, what would it look like if we did life together and loving outward? Um, both those things at the exact same time. So let me give you a little review of last week. Last week, when Nicodemus went to Jesus by night, representing the ruling council of Israel, most likely to seek a new alliance between Jesus and the Pharisees, Jesus gave Israel, Israel's religious elite, some tough love. Jesus said, you must be born again. Israel didn't need to make some tweaks. They had to push the reset button on it all because the whole system, the whole religious system during Jesus' day was a disaster. People were more into religion than having a relationship with God. They were more into following the rules and regulations than they were into loving God and loving neighbor as self. And so we see this in church history. There's this pattern that we need to go through a major rehaul about every 500 years or so. Our last one was the Protestant Reformation. Today the church is in need of reset. And this series is an attempt to look at what that might look like. And this is an attempt at me trying to follow God's Spirit, maybe even prophetically speak to the church saying there's something wrong. We must relook. We must take a look at it once again. We must get back to the movement of God's Spirit. We must get back to Jesus. We must. And so today I want to look at the church in reset mode must function in two distinct expressions. One, life together. Life together, where we are a stable, nurturing, healthy church community. And two, the other side of the, this coin here, um, two coins, the other side would be loving outward, where we're innovative and adaptive and experimental in reaching unchurched people. So we want to do both of these at the exact same time. 
And these different expressions are found in different locations in the book of Acts in the Bible. The author was Luke, and so he talks about a church in Jerusalem. Now the church there served those already familiar with the Bible and the traditions of Israel. And the church in Antioch became this missional outpost, reaching like the gospel had to press into brand new territory that had never been before, and they were reaching unchurched Gentiles, a very, very difficult task. And so today the church in Reset needs to function both of these expressions at the exact same time. Uh, It's kind of like learning to walk and chew gum at the same time. We can do that, right? It doesn't, it's not that difficult. But sometimes there's tension. Uh, We feel tension between Jerusalem and Antioch. Why can't we just be a good local church, John, doing what good local churches do? Why do we feel our job is to reinvent church and, you know, reach the unchurched and dechurched? And you always talk about those people. And if I could answer that, I think it's in the depths of my soul, I feel the Holy Spirit demanding that we do this, demanding that we rethink and reframe because God loves the church. We're his bride and he loves the church. He wants his church back. The church in reset needs to be aware of these two different expressions and really honor both at the same time. Even though you might have sympathies towards one side of the coin. So the first section I want to talk about is um, life together and what does that look like in our church? Um, And I I just, this John chapter 13, verse 34, John quotes Jesus here. And Jesus says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Um, And I love that Jesus lays it all out saying the internal community in the church, if it looks like love and you guys are actually loving each other, the world is going to know. The world, you're going to prove to the world that you are the disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, And to be honest, guys, the church has suffered a lot of bad press lately, haven't we? A lot of bad press. Um, It's easy to underestimate the power of a great local church that's following Jesus, that's loving each other, that's caring for one another in the middle of life's problems, in the middle of COVID-19. So it's real easy to just say, well, healthy church life, that's just, yeah, it's, a lot of churches don't have that, guys. And I love that we as a community, we push in there. We have developed community and, and we're saying we want to do this with excellence. We can be so amazing as a church if we just learn to follow Jesus, love each other, and that's, you're going to prove to the world that you're my disciples. So Carol, this is a great story. It's fun. Um, Carol was a clerk at a local bookstore. And she often, she was a Christian that went to one church and she would often get Christian groups coming in and they would have like, they would buy coffee and they would sit in the bookstore and they'd do like a book study. Well, one day, um, Carol came in and there was a, a group of, a group came in and the pastor, his name, Pastor John, was there, not me. Um, and so they all go over there and, but Carol loved to refer to the church as the body. And so, um, you know, this new, this body came into her, her bookstore where she's working. And then finally, um, the, the group that was meeting, they, they, they were done. They prayed together. They were leaving, but Pastor John went over and found a book that he wanted to buy and got in Carol's line. And he got to the front of the line. He sets his book down and Carol goes, I just, Pastor, they, they chat for a little bit and, and she said, Pastor John, uh, I love that you guys come here. Uh, Pastor John, I, and she got so excited and she kind of like screams out in, you know, the, the like squealing type kid voice. Oh, Pastor John, I just love your body. And all the customers in line, they laughed. 
John looked down, and Carol turned very red. Now, Carol was talking about like the group that John's overseeing, right? This church group. Now, guys, it's a great story, right? But we need our city, our neighbors, us as a community to say, man, I love this body. I love this body. We love each other. You guys, I worked in community mental health in college, and the main thing that uh, degrades mental health is isolation. The number one thing. People are cut off from family, friends, supportive community. In research, you call this social capital. Harvard researcher Putnam says that if you are in a church, just by going on Sundays, this is in even that's not even with connecting um, beyond that, like in a in a vineyard community group or another type of group. If you just go on Sundays, you have forty percent more social capital than people not in church. And that translates into less depression and suicide, better sleep, fewer headaches, less chronic problems. Um, so I'm a middle-aged man now. I, I realize that I'm 45, but I was thinking the other day, like, uh, I was thinking about my friendship circle, and I've got so many amazing friends that care for me and love me. Do you know that the typical middle-aged man has one person to turn to in a crisis? But if he's part of a church, he has many more people to turn to when he runs into marriage problems or job problems or alcohol problems. He has many more trusted people to turn to. And you guys, that's life-saving, isn't it? That's marriage-saving. That's family-saving. So look at parenting today. Um, It's focused on giving kids every advantage for material success as if Um, Being a child is about building a great resume for college. Meanwhile, neglecting kids, um, uh, meanwhile, neglecting to help kids become great human beings. And there's been all kinds of research studies on this issue, but over the past 40 years, um, these studies all have shown a significant reduction in the ability for kids to show empathy to put themselves in the shoes of others, to care for others. You guys, a great, local, healthy church helps parents build a spiritual framework for their kids to love God above themselves and to love their neighbor as themselves. Personally, I cannot begin to express how much I appreciate the local, healthy church in my life over the years. Uh, 22 years ago when my father passed away in a car accident, I, there was one thing I remember going to church in that season and people just sitting in worship and worshiping God and then teaching and I felt like God was speaking to me in those moments and then all of a sudden people would come up in hugs and kisses and life and shared life. It was beautiful. It was enormously uplifting and comforting in that season especially Um, and then even beyond Sundays I remember going to our what we call at the time life groups in college and I realized oh my gosh this is so beautiful these guys care for me and we've developed relationships and I can trust them and I can be honest about how broken my soul was over this thing for us we have vineyard communities um, and, and so like Sunday morning's one thing, but let me tell you, when you get into one of these vineyard communities, it changes everything for us. Um, there was a church sign, true, this is a, there was a church sign, it said, we care about you Sundays, 10 a.m. only. If, and they didn't mean, it didn't, it, yeah, they wrote that out and they didn't even realize how bad it was until later on, right? But let me tell you, we as a church, we're not just a Sunday thing, we are 24 7 seven days a week like all 365 right we are about loving people and i so i want to encourage you guys to get into a vineyard community it will it can save your life when you have space and i know that we're still doing um those online for many of you and i think some of our vineyard communities are starting to relaunch in homes again so plug in get plugged in um 
You guys, I, when I have friends through vineyard community groups, it helps me not fall into a pit. And it helps me keep on track and push forward. It helps me not go into hiding. So I just want to say thank you for being a great local church. Thanks. Uh, Tabers, thanks for helping. Um, and you other leaders as well. But I'm in the Tabers group. So. Um, so let me show you one picture of the great local church. Um, there's a mission trip to Mexico and these kids were teaching the kids. This is the church. This is the steeple. Open the doors. See all the people inside. And they were teaching, as they were teaching this to the kids, um, they realized that one of the kids didn't have a right hand. So he only had his left hand. And, this, and they're all embarrassed. All the kids that are teaching this, here's a church, here's a steeple, open the door, see all the people. Um, they're embarrassed. They don't know what to do. And instantly, this young little boy, five or six years old, just grabs his neighbor's hand. And they did this together. And that's a, such a great picture of the church when we can rely on one another. Love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You guys, we have a great body, don't we? We have a great body. Everyone who helps make the church work and move and is tied into um, helping community happen around here, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your money. Um, it makes all the difference in the world. So let me dive into now loving outward. And we're called to be a missional outpost, and that's what has to happen when the church, what the church must be and become anytime the gospel moves into new territory or a new time. And really for us, it's a new time, right? So here is Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I, give, I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Go make disciples. It's like Jesus' most important words right at the end, right before he's taken away, taken up. Um, anyway, such important words for the church. Missionaries from the U.S., uh, go to have never heard the gospel before like my brother was ministering to tibetan chinese and he's forming a missional outpost there on arrival they find out that sharing the gospel doesn't work in the new place like it did in america and so they're forced to do a major rethink as they translate the gospel into this new cultural framework and and just you know it's not superficial work it's not just taking the gospel and putting Tibetan clothes on it, right? It goes much deeper than that. Uh, it involves taking a deeper look at the gospel in light of Tibetan context. Um, and I don't know if you guys have heard of Don Richardson, one of my heroes of the faith. He was a missionary, Papua New Guinea. Um, he wrote a book called Peace Child. He wrote another one called Eternity in Their Hearts. Great reads for you guys. But um, when Don went to Papua New Guinea, uh, he was there... And he starts learning the language and he starts sharing the life of Jesus. He, so he learned the language. He's learning how to make a language, a written language form. Um, and so, but these people that he's ministering to, they're head-hunting cannibals who impaled the heads of their enemies on poles after they killed them, right? And so the problem as Don was trying to minister he found out that the heroes of the Swazi were not those who took the greatest number uh, um, of, of their enemies in war. It was not that. But the, the greatest, those who achieved the, achieved the greatest uh, level of uh, treachery and betrayal were the heroes. So imagine as he starts talking about what Jesus, how Judas betrayed Jesus. Guess who the Swazis believed were the hero? They believed it was Judas. Completely different context, right? And so Don's thinking, what in the world? How do I communicate? Because they believed that um, betraying somebody super close to you was the ultimate way of saying, I win over you. 
And so they venerated Judas to the epitome of manhood and they regarded his kiss as the best possible outcome that you could possibly have in life. And so Don was forced to say, what do we do here? And just, you know, the end of the story is amazing. I can't tell it today, but uh, the end of the story, this, the, this, t- these two tribes, they, they come to find Jesus in a dramatic, powerful way. But he had to think through these structures. Structures in new to gospel cultures can be very difficult. Now we see this in the Bible, Old Testament prophets pressing reset, doing a rethink in the face of the Babylonian exile. They are away from the temple, and Israel was a temple-centric religion. And these exiles are forced to probe the depths of the meaning of their own faith when they don't have the temple, okay, for sacrifice. Um, and going into the New Testament, Paul sent, Paul sent to launch several missional outposts among the Gentiles. Now, Antioch's the first, but many others follow. And notice how Paul uses different language for the gospel than Jesus does dealing with the different challenges at the time. And all of this is a function of the mission to the Gentiles, these people that are completely, you could say, unchurched. So here is, and just, you know, I, a couple months ago, I did a, a, a great exegesis of this, and we went through what, what does this look like. Um, but just give you a little taste of it again. Uh, Acts seventeen twenty two. 22. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way, For as I was walking among you, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had an inscription to it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. Now, Paul uses very different language, right? Did you know that Vineyard USA is part of a rethink that began about 35 years ago in evangelicalism? And it's just an, it's been an experiment since day one because within that evangelical framework, we cast out dispensationalism, we cast out fundamentalism, um, which are two super powerful evangelical theological systems, right? And what we did is we said, let's recenter around the kingdom of God. Let's redo. Um, we had to rethink life after death um, centered gospel. And, set, and we had to say, what about new creation now? The kingdom of God breaking in now, restoring and renewing all things. So, and did you know that the American church for the longest time has said it's all about life after death? And it is, but it's also about life now. What if the church got, set, got together and said, no, it's, it is about the future, but it's also about now stuff. It's about life now and freedom now and, and um, uh, relationship with God now and, uh, and about like, the most beautiful things in the world. It's, it's about now stuff. It's about ha- developing this ongoing conversational relationship with God now. We get to do that now stuff. We get to help God in uh, bringing heaven to earth. Like God does that and we partner with him to change this world here and now. I love that. We also had to rethink as a vineyard movement the relationship between arts and faith. We had to rethink life together and love outward because we had to pair those t- together. We had to reset a mission-driven process, and that's essential to a faithful rendering of the gospel in the 21st century. You guys, let's make disciples. Let's go for it. We experience this as refreshing. Um, and some of you are saying, John, I haven't heard this type of talk before. And it kind of makes sense. Yeah, this is interesting. I like this. And challenging, because many of you are saying, ugh, Okay, it makes sense, but uh, it seems messy and it makes me think a lot and I don't know and I'm nervous. Of course, we're in over our heads. And I feel in over my head, to be honest. And of course, we're not really equipped for such a thing. But that's the kingdom of God at work. Ready or not, here it comes. And we just have to move with the Spirit. Every generation is not called to engage in such a significant rethink, but some generations are, and we're in one of those times right now, people. Uh, Guys, this will all work out as long as we do this. We grease the gears with love and understanding. We're not just doing this for ourselves. We're doing this for generations to come. 
We're doing this for people who have let, been left behind by the church a long time ago. We're doing this for unchurched people. We're doing this for de-churched people, people that were once in church and who have been beat up and spit out. We're doing it for them. So let's grease the gears with love and understanding. God wants to use us. And it's going to take us doing life together, being a great, local, healthy church, and loving outward, being this missional outpost to reach people right where they're at. So let me give you two practical tips today. One, identify your sympathies. Do you naturally identify with the great, healthy, local church expression or the missional outpost expression? If you like stable, nurturing, healthy community, it's all about life together and it's a, the great local church. If you thrive on change and innovation, it's loving outward, it's that missional outpost. Um, once you know your sympathies, rejoice in, the ex, in that expression in the church and even lend a hand to the plow, but don't forget to honor the importance of the other and value the, expression, the other expression at the same time. Okay, so I feel like almost every one of us, we like, we do like, it's the one side of the coin. And, and it's okay that you focus on one side of the coin, but don't neglect the, the, your brothers and sisters that are holding up the other banner on the other side, okay? So both these expressions at the same time lived out. And number two, jump in and serve in this season. Let's be a healthy, stable, nurturing community post-COVID. We need, an ex, we need extra hands this season of change. Uh, contact the office, or if you want to contact Vicki, you can, to get connected to an area of service. There is room for you. We are a church that believes everybody gets to play in the game. Everybody gets to do ministry. So we are going to uh, sing this last song. Um, so let's sing this last song together. And then, um, and maybe during this song, you could think, what? What is, what's God doing and saying to my heart this morning as I've just heard this, this new, maybe a framework uh, for understanding life together and loving outward? And, and as our church tackles that and really puts that um, forward, what, what does that look like for you? Okay, let's sing together.
temptation comes this way And when we cannot stand we'll fall on you Jesus you're our hope and stay So teach this song to rise to you When temptation comes this way when we cannot stand, we'll fall on you. Jesus, you're our hope and stay. When we cannot stand, we'll fall on you. Jesus, you're our hope and stay. I want to close in a word of prayer, but I want to encourage you. Let's, let's do life together. Let's love outward. And for some of you that are listening, you're like, I really, I feel called um, to step in deeper. I want to encourage you. Follow God's spirit. Um, move in. Like, like, like some of you, God's calling into leadership and you're kind of more new. I want to encourage you, like, let's just go for it. The kingdom of God is on the advance. God's inbreak and rule and reign. And it's up, it, well, I, we're just going to say, God, use us in that process. Um, and so I just want to pray for us this morning. And I also want to pray for those people that are, um, you're still just really wrestling with isolation and loneliness. And uh, you just still feel stuck. And I'm going to pray for you this morning. So Holy Spirit, come, Lord, we welcome your living presence. Jesus, we absolutely want to be a part of your inbreaking rule and reign, your church on the advance, moving forward in society today. And so, Holy Spirit, Lord, we welcome you to do that with us, with our church. We want to be the great, local, healthy church, and we want to be a missional outpost to reaching the unchurched and dechurched in our community. So Lord, we just pray right now that we would be your hands and feet in this season. That we would be your people that are willing to jump in and really fight for a healthy, vibrant, um, stable place for our, our, us to worship together. And that we would be willing to fight for that reaching out, that, that, the, uh, that church that really stands up and is... Uh, ministering and sharing the gospel to those that are really far from God right now in society. And so, Lord, I also pray for every single person that's dealing with fear, that's isolated, that's lonely right now. I just pray your blessing over their lives. I pray that um, as we're reemerging in this kind of season, that your spirit would be with them, that they would dive into community for those that... Um, that are wrestling with even just, can I even go outside? I just pray that you give them wisdom and discernment uh, in the right time and right season for stepping out. And so Holy Spirit, come. Yeah, I just pray your blessing over our lives. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Go be the salt and light of this world, the very hands and feet of Jesus in our community. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great day.